On this course, I, I must admit, I really I enjoy this particular lecture perhaps more than any other one that I give because it's the one case where we get to go kind of full circle. We're going to like we start the year off on a uh, particular trajectory. We go through this case, three to case history, going through Ireland, and I appreciate that. You know, when you see these things, there's just so many words. There's there's so much new stuff that's going on. You've got no idea about what's going on. However, after having kind of gone through and uh, you know seeing all of these different kinds of surveys, what we're going to do today is just kind of take a step back, kind of walk our way really quickly through the essentials of, of that, and. I think you'll just be amazed at uh, are with everything that's presented and what you know. And that's actually a good verification. And sometimes just to kind of find out what you do know is extremely important and it kind of uh, provides a good basis. Uh, before we actually get into that, however, I, I want to uh, take this opportunity to remind you that <coughs> a lot of work from your perspective you should see how much work this course is from the TA's perspective this is a huge amount of stuff it's constantly being marked it's constantly being developed putting together the apps the GPG all of these things uh, have required really a monumental effort on the part of the uh, of the TA's and I'm just really I, I'm so impressed with the dedication that these guys have given, and uh, I just hope you appreciate it too. So I think a big round of applause is. <laughs> I think we should have a party. So, first of all, is anybody allergic to peanuts? Everyone except me. <laughs> Sweet. Okay, so I got to tell you, that's that's my wife at seven, seven o'clock this morning, <laughs> making monster cookies. So these things, uh, these things are absolutely. We can start another one from this end. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but if, it, if it's being video. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. Hmm, maybe after. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, this is this is my 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 wife, and she got up this morning to uh, bake these cookies. So they are more or less hot out of the, of the oven. Uh, there are six cups of peanut butter in there, <laughs> just for starters. <laughs> and uh, yes, there you have it. So uh, yes, as one of the things in reviewing this this course, the, uh, the uh, as I told you, what we're going to view everything through something called the seven-step uh, solution. And on the first day of class, I found this just outside. It was on the, on the engineering care. And I thought, how appropriate is, is that, right? Even, even the engineers are into it. Seven, seven steps, seven views. <laughs> so uh, the other seven steps are, are these. This is a really, really good way of kind of encapsulating information about every kind of survey and every kind of problem that you've got. It's, it's just a way of 
kind of thinking about things. Okay, what's the question to be answered? What's the diagnostic physical property? What survey should I choose? What's my data acquisition? What data are actually going to be collected? What processing? What interpretation? And the synthesis. We are taking every applied problem that we've got and we're kind of putting in all of you know, within the context of those steps. And the other thing it does is that it allows you, if you're talking to somebody and they're putting it in terms of these steps and you know at which step they are, you immediately can connect. You got, you're, you're sort of already kind of focused on kind of helping with their problem or knowing where your problem is. So remember the first case history was uh, looking at this till layer through, uh, through, through Dublin, right? So it was a, a, it was a hard uh, lodgment till. So it has got uh, a big stiffness as associated with it. So it's got um, high velocities. And, and remember there was some physical properties. There was bulk modulus, there's shear modulus, and, uh, and, and P wave velocity. And the thing about the till is that it would have a really high velocity compared to the overlying material. And then we have a few types of waves. Remember we had shear waves, they call S waves, P waves, compressional waves, really, and, uh, and, and love waves. So what was done is they brought this uh, little truck in that had a weight drop on the back. You don't really see it very much here, but you know, they basically drop a weight here and they've got these geophones that are sitting out there. And those geophones measure these arrival uh, waveforms, and what you're really interested in, in this particular case, is, is the character of those waveforms. And we're able to take those, do some processing, we never showed you how to do this, uh, but basically it allowed you to get information that was subsequently inverted to get this, which you are interested in. This is a, uh, a section of the velocity map, the shear velocity, as a function of depth, and you can see where the red is, and where, so that's the high values, and that can tell you what the uh, depth of that uh, high velocity wave is. So that was, that was the process there. That was looking, that was effectively MASW, right, which you will see. And then here was the seismic uh, survey that we did. We did uh, the refraction survey where we got information that went down, sort of across the bottom, and then back up. We looked at the seismic sections, and we saw these waves that were coming in here. Those were the direct waves that's traveling right along the surface. This was a wave that was uh, coming in. It's a reflection that's coming on. And then this is another wave that's a refractive wave that's coming in. So if we got the velocity, we could get the slope here, get that velocity, slope here, get the velocity of the underlying layer, and then with this uh, uh, distance, uh, time difference here, we could actually get what the uh, thickness and the velocity were. So that was the pro process here. Go along, find the first breaks. And then we could have multi layers of, of this stuff too. So sometimes you could come down and have a refraction off of the second layer. And so you'd get multiple guys. And then working with the slopes and with the intercepts, that actually gave us enough information to calculate what the thickness was. So that was the seismic refraction. So you had the MS, MASW, had the seismic refraction. And then the other thing is the seismic reflection. In doing this, we have some kind of a source and a whole bunch of re receivers, and you just move everything along. And every time you have a shot, you get uh, some kind of, well, you get a seismic record at each of these. And if you put all of the records together with a particular shot, you have a shot gather. So it's all the records associated with one shot. Then you can take this and you could move it along, and then you get a whole bunch of these different shot gathers. And then it's a matter of just rearranging these guys so that you worked with sources and receivers that had a common midpoint. So I'd take it, this source, this receiver, this source, that receiver, dot, 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 but they all have this common midpoint. And 
we we just get all these the shot gathers do all of these kinds of uh, of collections of those data and then with these common midpoint gathers we'd recognize that there is events that were coming out and they have this hyperbolic uh, character to them. When we then went and did this, what we called normal move out correction, that allowed us to straighten these guys out. And we would find that particular velocity that straightened these out the maximum amount. And then once we did that, we'd stack them up and then we'd get a single trace. So that was the process. We'd go from shot gathers to common midpoint gathers, recognizing that we've got particular events that are coming in, decide what our normal move out correction should be, make that correction, stack them, and get a single trace. And then the idea was that that final trace is kind of like a, we think of it as a, a, a normal incidence seismogram where it I'm getting reflection information from everything that's directly beneath me. So coincident transmitter and receiver, and I'm just getting all these reflections that are coming back. And one trace doesn't tell us anything, but if I put a whole bunch of them together, then I can make a, a, a section that looks like this, and I can find kind of coherent energy. I can find things that are breaking through there a little bit. And especially if I have a drill hole that's coming through here, it's like, oh, I know what this is. I know what it is here. It's probably the same thing over here. And then I'm just kind of good to go. So that was seismic. Then we did sand and gravel quarries. So the idea here was, and we just did this, so I don't have to spend very much time on this. We had this you know, land that looks like this, some of it had been glaciated in the past, and there's a lot of sand and gravel, which is what the, what people were looking for. And the other part was kind of boggish. Like, so it was the uh, physical properties that were of, of interest was electrical conductivity, because the gravels would have a really low conductivity, and the bogs would have a high conductivity as well as perhaps seismic uh, velocities. So that introduced us to electrical conductivity. We saw this map, a whole <coughs> bunch of different types of uh, you know, rock units. So some are really conductive, some are really resistive. So permafrost, metamorphic rocks, they don't pass electricity very easily. But massive sulfides and salt water is great easily pass electricity. So if we come back here, then what was done was actually three surveys, and you know about all of them. The first one was an electromagnetic survey that was just really easy to do as a reconnaissance. It was just this EM31. Remember that? It's just on this pole, something at about 10,000 hertz. It's got a transmitter and receiver. You just sort of walk around here, and there's pipes of this that are really pretty red. So that's indicating the bogs, high conductive. There's parts that are really low, uh, very blue. So that's potential sand and, and gravels. So right there, you've got a map. If you look at here, you have no idea where anything is, right? You look at a geophysical map, you can start to focus in like, OK, I'm probably interested in here. So now you pick out a couple of points in here and say, well, maybe it's worthwhile getting some more data. So let's pick out a traverse here or, or, or here, and let's go do some more ge geophysics. And the geophysics that you could do could be a DC resistivity, where you, you know, now we're putting electrodes into the ground, measuring the potentials, and take those data. We'd get, a, first of all, a pseudo section, then we'd invert them, and we get a picture now that looks like this. So this is electrical conductivity, function of distance and depth. This is true depth, so it's not a pseudo section. And we see that there's blue up here, so that's resistive with our color scale. And that actually provides additional information that this is likely to be sand and gravel. The other piece of information in here, although it's not nicely presented, is the results of doing a a seismic refraction survey over there and contoured on here 
are the velocities, and the high velocities are, are coming in here. This is all low velocity. Again, confirming evidence or suggestions that, okay, this is loosely consolidated material, low velocities. That's consistent with sand and gravel. Everything's consistent with low resistivity. I mean, you're, you're probably really good to go. No drill holes. Uh, number three, so we were looking at uh, peat thickness. Okay, so peat is uh, a, a good conductor. It's also got a lot of water content in it. And maybe water content is something that uh, differentiates it between uh, you know, other, other materials. And so whenever you're talking about water content and near surface, the thing that you immediately think about is ground penetrating radar. So the dielectric constant, the electrical permittivity. So this is uh, a number of different you know, rock units. Uh, this is dielectric constant. Dielectric constant, the biggest thing is water. And it doesn't matter whether it's fresh water or salt water. Uh, it's uh, got a dielectric constant of 80. And then air has got a relative dielectric constant of one, and other things are, are in between. With ground penetrating radar, the other thing that's really important is electrical conductivity, right? Because electrical conductivity tell, you know, controls how much the wave decays as you go down. In, in, in <coughs> and so you can see here, this is the electrical conductivity in siemens per meter. Uh, Seawater is like 3,000. And you know, fresh water is 0.01. So you're not going to get very much penetration in seawater, but you could get good penetration in uh, fresh water. So this was the basic uh, experiment. We've got a transmitter and receiver. Kind of looks seismic, but it's not. It's an electromagnetic experiment. So we actually have antennas that are going out there. There's a generator that's feeding into these things. You've got electromagnetic waves that are going down and coming back. But they travel just like waves, right? So they get refracted, they get reflected, they get transmitted. So that kind of stuff with Snell's law, that's, that's all the same for seismic as it is for electromagnetics. So we're going to go, go ahead and collect those data and then see what we can get out of that. So here was the instrument here. Here's your ground penetrating radar system. There's a little thing on the wheel to tell you how far you're, you're actually going, and there's a GPS link, and you just go tooling around over the whole area, you know, collecting these data, and the data looks like this. So this is a radar gram, looks like a seismogram. If I didn't tell you one of them was seismic or the other was uh, <clears throat> Uh, GPR, you wouldn't know except this axis here, the time axis is in nanoseconds, which is telling you that hmm, things are pretty fast, this must be a GPR signal. So this is, this is the signal that you get, but in this particular case you are on topography, so if you take account of that topography and then replot that, you actually get something that looks like this. So there's, there's a, a reflective horizon in here, which is almost uh, linear and flat. And that is actually uh, you know, the piece of information that you're looking for. It will tell you what the uh, depths of some of the deposits are. And so with that, you can get then a thickness of, of the peat. And now you could go ahead and do some extra boreholes and do, do some stuff, but you kind of know where in the whole scheme of things you, 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 you really are. You're looking for big, thick peak, you can be over here, not over here. We didn't talk very much about gravity. It's the only one that we never really got to. It's perhaps the simplest of, of all, but I think you got the idea anyway. And you, you will see, oh, stuff in the news, especially uh, you know, in southern United States, you know, places like Florida, you know, they've got all kinds of karst, you know, cavities. So sometimes, you know, you've got a, you know, house sitting up here and the next morning it's kind of falling in. Uh, so absence of mass gives you a low uh, density and 
that gives rise to uh, a gravity anomaly. We, uh, we looked at that in conjunction with a DC resistivity e experiment. So this was the result of a gravity anomaly. And I think the only thing we need to know is that we've got a region in here, which is red, which indicates really low gravitational value. So there must be absence of mass here. And then when we do the DC resistivity, which you do know more about, we ended up with a section that looked like this. And in this particular case here, we see that this we've got some kind of upper conductive channel that's coming in here and it's coming down here. And this is the thing that was indicative of that uh, karst domain. Uh, so then we went to mineral expiration. So mineral expiration, the two things are uh, electrical conductivity and sometimes uh, induced polarization. We're going to kind of concentrate on the latter. We didn't really work through this particular case history so much. It wasn't the greatest case history. But what we did do is look at some of the fundamentals of chargeability, which kind of gave you this uh, kind of cartoon diagram. This is a good one to sort of think about. Uh, imagine that we've got a pore throat here, and we've got a whole bunch of uh, sort of neutral water that's, that, that's sitting here. If we now put an electric field on here or battery, then we tend to get these buildup of charges, positive on one side, negative on the other. And that gives us kind of like a net uh, you know, uh, electric dipole. And that effect of that could be measured at the surface. Different rocks, different chargeabilities. Some rocks are really low, like sandstones have got pretty low chargeability. But if you go to sulfides especially, they have very large chargeabilities. And that's why the IP is used a lot in, uh, in mineral exploration, because it's connected with these uh, sulfides. And different, yeah, as I say, different minerals. So pyrite has really uh, high chargeability, whereas malachite has got really very small. In that particular case history, there were two things, two maps that were plotted. One was the apparent resistivity. So they did a DC resistivity, and they got the apparent resistivity. So that's a pseudo section type of, of map. And then the same is true with the apparent chargeability. So that's also kind of a pseudo section map. We were actually more interested in doing something a bit more sophisticated. I showed you this a couple of times. Uh, this was that region in Australia where they did a DC resistivity and IP experiment. We first of all got apparent resistivities. This was a, a dipole pole experiment. So you should kind of remember how those things work as far as what the, uh, how the electrodes are generated. We've got some high red values here, which means it's conductive. If you change the orientation, just turn everything around, have a pole dipole experiment, we have something that, that looked like that. So pictures, but they don't really tell you. There's only one Earth there. There's already 20 pictures, so what's the what's really there. So in, that, in order to do that, huh. okay, again, this one. But anyway, so then we did, that was the DC resistivity. We could also do the same with the, uh, you know, with, with the chargeability. And then when we go ahead and invert both of those, when we inverted the DC resistivity, we ended up with this big conductor that was coming here. So that was valuable geologic information. It wasn't too super from the point of view of minerals, but good geology. And then over here we did the chargeability, so a different kind of picture. And it turned out this guy in here was the piece of mineral, you know, the mineralization. So I think the impact here is that, uh, you know, one particular physical property doesn't tell you everything. In this case, you know, conductivity tells you something. Chargeability tells you something else. Put together, they help you with your uh, interpretation. 
that actually this was, although it's uh, the sixth module in that paper, uh, this was actually the first one that we did. This was magnetics, right? So for minerals application, this is something that is virtually always done, uh, is you, you've got a particular geology here. You go across and you take a magnetic, do a magnetic survey. And what we're seeing here is really high concentrations of the magnetic data and some, some over here. So that tells you something. And in fact, these high concentrations actually map with ultramafic rocks that are sitting up here. So there's, there's a bit of a correspondence. But you don't really know what's happening at the depth. And to make some progress in that, we had to understand something about the fundamentals of magnetics. And our idea there was that you know, each particle that we've got uh, you know, in the ground you know, has probably got a little magnetic moment that's attached to it. And in a random, you know, without any kind of external field, they're just sort of jumbled up. But if we put a field on it, then they will try to align. And then we can measure the result of those uh, little magnets with a magnetometer out here. Again, different rocks have a whole bunch of, of a wide variety of magnetic susceptibility. And you notice that these things overlap. So even if you knew the magnetic susceptibility of a rock, of, that something had a value of 10 to the minus 2, couldn't tell you whether it was a metamorphic rock, a gabbro, or a city volcanic. Uh, but it does provide some indication about what, uh, what the rock type could possibly be. And also, it's the structure that you see in the end that really kind of helps define what you're looking for. So if we come back to here <clears throat> with those are our data, and then we went ahead and we inverted those. Now we've got a 3D picture of, of, of what's there. This picture is great, right? It, it, it tells you a lot about what's happening in that third dimension. And you can see that, OK, we've got these uh, ultramatrix that are up here and here. And then actually, those guys were joined uh, at depth to, to, together. And that turned out to be uh, pretty important for that. So that's a real quick run through, but I, I think it, I, I think that should emphasize again, if you, if you just took a step back from yourself, just how familiar all that stuff is to you and how, uh, how much you understand, right? You, like you, you, you can see waves go through, you can see little magnets line up, you can see all these things, right? So that's a really kind of important aspect. So I, maybe what I want to leave you with is, is, is really the following, that, that, that geophysics has got this potential to solve this huge array of problems. It can't necessarily give you the answer, but I think you'd be hard pressed to find many really uh, serious geoscience problems in which there wasn't some kind of a connection with a, you know, with a geophysical technique. So that geophysical technique might provide a lot of information. It might provide you just a little bit. But one way or another, you're, you're always in a position that you want to find out what's inside of something uh, without actually directly sampling. And that's where geophysics plays a role. The, the most important part in actually being able to, to do this is for you to take your problem and articulate it in terms of physical properties. That is the absolute crucial link. With, without that, there's this disconnect between you know, the engineer, the geologist, and, and, the, and the geophysicist. Because you have a problem. The only thing that the geophysicist can really deal with you know, are physical properties. Right? So somehow we have to make that connection. And here's where there, there, there's two things that are really important for conversing between two groups who don't really understand each other. And, and that is as, as follows. The first is physical properties, because both sides can understand that. 
The other is images. Because that's what you know, a geophysicist could produce. It gets a three-dimensional distribution of you know, a physical property, and it gives an image of that property. So if you have an understanding about what that property means to you, then you can look at that image and get structure or volume or, or, or whatever. Right? So that's, that's, the, that's the real key here to really making things work in, in a practical. And then, you know, once, once you've got that, then everything else is kind of a matter of like, okay, now here's what my seven-step uh, process is. And then you, know, you just go ahead and you, you, you carry that out. So I guess that's, that's good. So that, here's, here's my final thoughts. So if you're, if you're going to really use geophysics Thoughtly, then you just got to be kind of a, a critical thinker. You've got to try to understand, okay, where is everything kind of fitting together and to think about, you know, the aspects of your problem from a geologic perspective, from an engineering perspective, and then you know, a geophysical perspective. So you can do that. Okay, but the most important thing, and if, if you don't go away from this course with anything but this, it's the following. <laughs> no digging before geophysics. Okay? So I'm not sure if you can see, maybe I've turned off the light. Is that better? So can you recognize anybody there? There's lots of that, they're all digging. Um, <laughs> so that's very active. Look at that. Look, there's sand flying. Not bad. Not bad. Oh my god. I you know that that is so lame you kind of almost have to play it again, right? Okay, but we could uh, we could do better. So that wasn't that wasn't very dynamic. But this one, maybe this one's better. Come on, it's supposed to be a video. <laughs> so there weren't there weren't, there weren't enough shovels. Nice job. We have to do that again. <laughs> I like the hand motion. <laughs> okay. Here we go. So yeah, teamwork. That's always important, even if you're digging. Teamwork's important. <laughs> Was that the A team? I can't remember. <laughs> oh, you get so excited when you. <laughs> you can tell it's a sunny day, right? That was, that was good. <laughs> and uh, so look at that success. He's so cool about it too. Like, just like, <laughs> See, dig, dig way down. So it can, but you know, so digging, I think the point about this is digging can do it, but you needed a little a priori information. Helped. So sometimes you get lucky. But this is what I want to leave you with, right? Uh. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, isn't that easier? And it was actually more effective. But. <laughs> Okay, so that was my wish. Thank you, guys. <laughs> wish you success. But you, you have to promise me one thing. You got to invite me to your grad. Okay. Just the after party. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your, your grad parties are, are, are pretty good. So I, I actually I got I got one other thing to tell you about, and that is that. Uh,
two of your TAs are going on a trek. Ah. Ah. <laughs> two are going on a trip. So can you guess which two and where are they going? Africa. France. <laughs> France, Africa. Okay, so who's, who do you think is going? That's, that's kind of a tough question. Okay, who, who of your TAs do you think are going? <laughs> well, you got one behind. That would be a good guess. <laughs> Yeah, so Lindsay is going to go, and Sahi is going. So there they are, and they're going to go around with something called DISC, 2017. This is something put on by the Society for Exploration Geophysics. Talk about electromagnetics and uh, fundamentals and applications. Yeah. So kick off. If you want to come to Denver, January the 24th, okay. If you want to then come to South Asia, you could go to Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, Indonesia, and then India, Hyderabad. Bad? Then you could come back and you could go to Mexico and the rest of South America. So go to Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Peru, Colombia. From there, we go back to this region in, in the world here, New Zealand, Australia, uh, Philippines, and then back in the fall to Europe, to the United Kingdom, Denmark, uh, Switzerland, Austria, Italy, Germany. <laughs> And then wind up with Toronto and Calgary and oh, what happened to Houston? Houston. Right? <laughs> oh, South Africa. Yes, that's actually done. That is that will be the beginning of July. How about that for a tour? Okay. So if if you're nice to them, they might. They're not going to bring you a lot because there's not enough money, but they might bring you back something. A little, uh, a little voodoo doll from Africa. Or, <laughs> <I'm not sure. laughs> anyway, that's it, guys. You want, anybody want some more cookies? There's still some more cookies there. And then there's... Uh, does anybody have a question, actually? Oh, also, because uh, uh, I forget. So... Your questions are ones that you get for the TVL. They've been uh, posted. There's a sample questions for the uh, electrical conductivity and DC resistivity and IP. Uh, they'll be posted by tomorrow sometime. And then you'll have you'll have examples for multiple choice questions and examples for short answer and you have the midterm and then uh, yeah you know, the final exam is going to be basically like the midterm half multiple choice and probably one short answer question from each uh, you know, each survey test. Yeah. I was wondering if uh, the final exam if there's going to be any type of material related to the labs just because there's a lot of material to go over with, and to go over the labs again would be yes, very time consuming. We try to make the, the, the course slides, the lecture material, the labs, the TBLs, everything is, we've tried to make it all coherent. So I, I don't think you can partition any particular concept into any one particular category. I mean, our feeling was not that this is actually really challenging, is that, OK, we're going to present you with something. How can we present to you in four or five different ways so that it kind of reinforces it? So the first pass through the lectures are probably the most like scattered, right? Because 
you're seeing all this new stuff for the first time. There's new words. There's new, like, okay, I have no idea what's really going on. But that's okay. You need that because you actually remember some of that. Then you go to the lab, right? And then you start to see, oh, you got the same thing. I, I, you know, that looks familiar. Oh, but now we're doing this, right? Okay, now I'm starting to get it. Now we come across and you know, we do a TVL, and that's got something else. And then you do a quiz, and you know, that's good. So it's, it's, it's all reinforcing, but it's all geared towards kind of like a bottom up affair so that you, know, you build on something, you build more, you build more, you build more, and you gradually get to the top and you got it. But there's no, it, it's not like, okay, you're only going to have to work with the lecture material or only, you're only going to have to know the lab material or something. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. So you had a question. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask you, Lindsay, what are you going to be doing at all the places that you're going to conferences? I mean, uh, well, this is, Doug is leading the, the lecture tours, the distinguished instructor for 2017 with the ICG. And so um, Soggy and I will each sort of do half and be co-instructors. So there'll be one day of the course, and then after that, we're hoping to work with uh, local groups of people and find out what problems they're working on uh, capture as much of that as we can and uh, share it on the web. So hopefully by the end we actually have sort of a global collection of problems that people are working on related to EM. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go to all these different places. So the first day is basically you know, have a, a lecture because it's more interactive. So some of these apps that you've been playing with are going to, to surface there because we want to get people to understand what's going on because there's a lot of people that have to make decisions, especially about things like water management or you know, pollutants or you know, resource exploration. Uh, they have to make uh, decisions about whether they're going to use geophysics or not. So it's important that they understand some of the basic principles. So the first day is associated with that. Subsequent days are called disk lab days. And for that, we're trying to gather people in all walks, or the industry, government, university, people who have a, a, a geoscience problem that's somehow connected with electromagnetics. And we're going to sit down and work with them. They're going to give, first of all, a lightning talk, say, OK, here's what I do. right? And this is, this is how EM is, is playing a role. That's going to be captured, and it's going to be put onto YouTube. Then we're going to sit down with everybody. We're going to walk through each of their projects. We're going to discuss them. We're going to capture them in a seven-step manner. You know about that. So every problem is going to be captured in seven step. That also gets put on to YouTube. The benefit of that is that by the time we've gone to 33 different countries, we will have captured, you know, 300 case histories of applications of geophysics in a whole bunch of regions that you, I mean, for problems that you wouldn't even know about. There's some really cool stuff being done right now on submarine or ocean bottom work, both with respect to gas hydrates for a future energy resource, as well as for, you know, minerals, uh, just sort of sitting on the ocean floor. All kinds of things, you know, in the United States and elsewhere with respect to Okay, how do we manage our aquifers? What kind of information do, do we need? The state of California is now thinking about having mandatory airborne geophysics flown over most of the state to have some background information about where their aquifers are, what the status of their aquifers are. So all of these things are kind of you know, really, really ramping up, but I don't think there's anybody out there who's got a global perspective of all of the different application areas. And that's what we want to do. And we want to kind of break down those barriers. We want to sort of demystify electromagnetics because electromagnetics you know, is not trivial. It's, it's, it, it's not easily stood, uh, understood, and it's often misunderstood. And then it can be misused. So all of those things contribute very negatively. So we're going to try to you know, change that around a little bit. Talk to different people about what's happening and just elevate the use and the usefulness of electromagnetic giving. It's going to be a cool year. And so I won't be here next year to teach 350 courses. Somebody else will. Oh. Oh. <laughs> anyway, so listen, you guys, it's been great. Uh, 
So we'll see you in a week, right? Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. Next Friday.